Now he concludes this sort of long digression on Belgian small farming um, uh, with the remark that uh, the first step uh, in improving the same class of small farmers in Ireland is to assimilate their farming operations as much as possible to the sort of conditions uh, of agrarian capitalism that he noted in Belgium. And he felt that the poor law itself would be the central pillar in doing this. In fact, he said the poor law would be beginning at the lowest point in the scale. Improved management of small farmers would bring increased capital and improved habits amongst the cottier tenants. With the increase of capital will come a desire to extend these small holdings and thus will arise a tendency to consolidate occupancies for the employment of increased capital and so on. An increase in agricultural produce will speedily act on other sources of industry and thus the demands for the home market for agricultural produce will be augmented while for all that is produced above this demand the markets of England will of course be open. So it's clear that the poor law is starting at the beginning of a series of stages that, that begin the capital tr transformation of Irish society. Now a second example that I want to very briefly talk about is, is a very small uh, booklet that, um, that Nichols uh, authored uh, to better publicise his views on Irish improvement. Uh, partly because I suppose he felt that his, uh, his reports to the government would sit in, in, in libraries and be read by very few people, so he, he tried to write a more popular pamphlet. Now this pamphlet was published in 1841 and it's called The Farmer's Guide compiled for the use of small farmers and the cottier tenantry of Ireland. Now this book is um, uh, how best to describe it. Uh, I suppose an extraordinary testament to sort of colonial paternalism um, offering worldly advice ironically to a mostly illiterate audience um, on everything from how best to uh, um, uh, run uh, managed crops to livestock breeding uh, notes on personal cleanliness and how to set out the domestic arrangements within farmhouses and so on but above all the, the document uh, talks about the need to inculcate moral training in Ireland and to get rid of what he saw as slovenly habits uh, every man in good health wrote Nichols may obtain a sufficiency of wholesome food if he will make due exertion. And when we hear complaints every year of a want of food and observe a want of care and industry in making provision against the recurrence of that evil, one's commiseration is sometimes weakened. Adopting Malthusian tones, Nichols also urged moral restraint in the formation of early marriages and made clear his belief that depopulation was in fact the cornerstone of developing or regenerating Ireland. He went on to say... We by no means deny, but on the contrary would wish to secure to the poorer classes all those enjoyments which spring from the exercise of domestic and social feelings. But it must be borne in mind that everyone is bound both in a religious and moral sense to keep his animal impulses under the control of reason and not to wreck his own happiness and that of others by levelling them and himself with the brutes and disregarding the plainest dictates of prudence. So in a very practical way then, it's really important to see this sort of instructional guide uh, as a sort of more popular endorsement of, of beliefs that were entrenched within his formal report to the government. In other words, it was built into this view of uh, seeing that the first stage in developing Ireland is the rapid consolidation of small holdings, getting rid of cottier tenants. And territorially, this meant uh, turning uh, a land holding system uh, that looks something like this. This is from a, a, a handbook written by uh, uh, a self-described improving landlord in the north of Ireland. Who um, This is the, 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 hit the landowning area before he began his improvements where you can see the sort of, um, um, sort of uh, small holding nature and subdivision of the land very, very clearly and turning it into something much more ordered uh, like this. Now, other aspects of Irish behaviour were targeted for reform, um, but I think it's really important to note uh, one area in particular, and that's Irish diet. Um, and the reason why Irish diet, I guess, is targeted uh, during this period is because of a widely assumed belief that potato cultivation and uh, barbarity sort of went hand in hand. Uh, Charles Trevelyan, for example... Uh, I suppose the popular mantra for this is you are what you eat, uh, you know, but this became a sort of political mantra rather than a privately held view. 
So, for example, Charles Trevelyan, he professed that there's scarcely a woman of the peasant class in the west of Ireland whose culinary art exceeds the boiling of a potato. Amartya Sen, incidentally, um, I can't resist but quoting him, he quotes this line from Trevelyan, uh, and, uh, and he says, um, it's rare for an Englishman to find an occasion to criticise another country's culinary arts. Um, <laughs> but, but there you go. Uh, but Trevelyan certainly wasn't alone. Um, provided they have sufficient supplies of t uh, potatoes, remarked the Scottish economist, uh, J.R. McCulloch, they've been content to vegetate, for they can hardly be said to live in rags and uh, wretchedness. Nasu Sr. linked Irish diet to overpopulation very directly. A labouring population eating meat must be more thinly scattered than one eating corn, and a potato-fed community might be denser than one eating wheat. Now, it's hardly surprising, given these sorts of views, that when the poor law was eventually implemented in 1838, that dietary regulation was central to workhouse sort of discipline and life within the workhouse. In fact, one historian who analyses uh, a workhouse in Cork observed that the pauper diet was inter intervened with uh, 19, uh, a dozen times, sorry, in, in a very short period of time, over a 19-month period. Um, and in fact, uh, before the first year of blight, um, the Irish potato diet had been replaced by uh, portions of rice, soup and bread in 69 out of the 130 workhouses that were subsequently built. So this was, put, this was an ideology that was put into practice. And it was also an ideology uh, that is confirmed by more anecdotal evidence. So, for example, the Scotsman, John Forbes, uh, discovered only one workhouse in an extensive tour of Ireland where potatoes formed any part of workhouse dietary. And his, his reflection on this is quite interesting. He says, the, to you know, the total absence of potatoes in the workhouse dietaries of Ireland has always struck me as very singular. Has it been adopted with any view of weaning the people from this taste of the root? Or has it originated in purely economic views? Now, Forbes was actually willing to set aside these scruples, confident in the knowledge that a new dietary order would render Ireland, as he said, uh, more attached to cereal foods. James Caird agreed. He said, confidence in the potato, he's writing during the famine, um, is now completely shaken amongst the labouring classes and perhaps no better time may ever arrive for encouraging a resort to money wages. It's all about encouraging proletarianisation. The transformation uh, of the pauper diet um, also uh, confirmed to many officials that actually Irish habits could be moulded to suit a more commercialised economy. It gave people a sense of, of hope, if you like, that, uh, that, that the Irish could be bred into uh, better conditions. Now, my larger argument is that when the potato blight struck Ireland in 1845, this sort of language of improvement, this sort of language of transition, of development, uh, gets deployed not just through the poor law and its workhouses, but actually gets redeployed over and over again in every single uh, aspect of the government's um, famine relief effort. Or to put this differently, um, the government's famine relief policy uh, was carried out with a view of kick-starting a social, uh, social revolution in, uh, in, in the national economy. Now, I can't go into this in as much detail as I would like to, but I'd like to give you some examples of where relief policies fold into this sort of larger debate of regeneration and improvement. Um, a first example would be Robert Peel's uh, famine policy of sending direct food aid to Ireland. He sent Indian corn or maize uh, to Ireland. And this was openly theorised uh, as a means of stimulating food markets in Ireland and as a means of encouraging the sorts of dietary regeneration uh, we've just been looking at. In fact, the policy went hand in hand with the government's turn, the British government's larger turn, towards a policy of free trade, or in this period it's called laissez-faire, which began with uh, the repeal of the Corn Laws, um, a, a body of protectionist uh, policies that were very significantly um, uh, repealed uh, during uh, the Irish famine. Now, the repeal of, of these laws um, is quite interesting because Peel used uh, the blight in Ireland and the famine in Ireland um, as a sort of opportunity to, to sort of suggest that actually the difficulties in Ireland are the result of economic protectionism. 
um, if we could get cheap food to Ireland, there would be no famine, is essentially uh, his sort of argument. Um, so Ireland's food supply problems could be resolved if the government committed itself to laissez-faire. Now, this policy was pursued even when it was felt that actually uh, opening up markets and liberalisation and so on might actually increase the vulnerability of Irish farmers. Indeed, the Prime Minister himself was aware of this when he said, if there is a part of the United Kingdom which is to suffer by the withdrawal of protection, it was Ireland. Now, we can make similar sorts of claims about um, stimulating broader changes, in this case, uh, a move to, to free market ideas. If we look at uh, the government's uh, decision to implement public works, again, this was established by Robert Peel, uh, but it was revamped, or these policies were revamped under the next administration, under Lord John Russell. Now, uh, Labour, the, uh, the so-called um, public work schemes were essentially uh, employment schemes uh, uh, implemented throughout uh, the countryside. Now, these employment schemes were changed in 1847 with, the, with a, a new piece of legislation called the Labour Rate Act. And essentially, this act substituted uh, what was called task labour. Uh, for the daily wages that were previously paid. Previously, the government paid people to do work. Uh, uh, now, they paid people for the amount of work that they were able to perform. Now, the idea was uh, that in addition to making the work quite punitive and, and uh, intolerable uh, so that people wouldn't flood onto these works, um, the, the, the idea was that uh, by making it task-oriented, you would... Uh, so you would eliminate imposture, um, but you would also stimulate what was called independent industry. Uh, in other words, uh, you would sort of inculcate these habits of social autonomy that were seen as necessary to a sort of a, the, the operation of a successful market in labour and in land. Um, it was also felt that task work had to be paid below the uh, wages that were provided locally in that area. It was generally felt that if you paid Irish labourers uh, any amount above what was minimally necessary to keep people alive, you would only encourage unscrupulous conduct. So in a way, the uh, Labour Rate Act was encouraged to test destitution. Only those who were really uh, in need would, would apply for relief. Um, but it also placed uh, the burden of, of actually supporting this, the financial burden of su supporting these I I employment schemes on the shoulders of Irish landlords. So this was to be paid uh, uh, out, of, out of Irish pockets, or in the language of the time, Irish property was to pay for Irish poverty. And again, this was to encourage habits of self-reliance. 